I'd like to introduce you to today's presenters, David Esper and Michael White. David has over 20 years of consulting and industry experience in information technology and human capital management. He works with multinational companies primarily focused on global HCM-related projects utilizing SAP platforms and products. Michael is the director of SAP Technologies for GP Strategies Human Capital Technology Group. He's responsible for managing the technical resources that perform development and integration work in and out of both the SuccessFactors Cloud Solutions and the SAP ECC software platform. So with that, um, Michael, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you so that you guys can carry on the presentation. Welcome. Perfect. Thanks, Kayla. So the agenda for today, uh, we've got two sections that we're going to cover. One is how to prepare, so going through prepping for uh, employee central uh, projects and, and the pitfalls to avoid as part of that process, and then what to avoid, so what are the, the major challenges or, or major obstacles that you need to avoid as part of an implementation project. So to start with, how to prepare. So expertise, so one of the very first, I think, and most important things is to get your HR subject matter experts engaged early in the project planning. Um, having the correct people involved in the initial uh, requirements gathering sessions, the initial documentation se sessions, is going to be critical to project success. Um, those are going to be the end users who are in the trenches every day, they understand uh, what your current processes are, even the undocumented processes that take place in day-to-day -day activities. And those are going to be the people that you need in those requirement gathering sessions in order to facilitate uh, driving out the true requirements for your project as opposed to just what you may already have on paper as your current process. So having them engaged early is, is extremely critical. Um, the other thing is that from a global requirements gathering perspective, um, one of the biggest challenges is trying to gather requirements from regions all across the world that all have different processes in place, uh, especially if you're moving from a legacy system that doesn't have as much of an automated and form-driven process as Employee Central. So being able to go out and gather what they're doing today per country or per region having local or regional subject matter experts for those countries do some of that initial legwork of requirements gathering to pull that data together and then aggregate that into uh, the overall workshop meetings that you take part in uh, is also a big, big facilitator for, for driving your true requirements and having uh, the, proper, uh, the proper information to start on the workshops. Um, from a partner perspective, obviously, Due to the complexity of um, trying to drive out these types of requirements on a global level, uh, having a partner who has experience doing that already is a big plus, right? So having a partner who has specialists that understand the employee central data model that have done these types of global requirements gathering sessions previously uh, is a major factor in having successful requirements gathering workshop and avoiding pain down the road. Dave, anything you want to add here? Yeah, I would, I would uh, jump in and, and you know, always, uh, we always encourage or we like to, you know, get as many consultants involved um, in, in the upfront process as, as possible, even before, you know, the partner selection has been made. Um, obviously, we have salespeople just like everyone does, uh, and a lot of our sales folks have very, you know, excellent backgrounds. However, they're not the experts in, you know, in the actual implementations, in managing the implementation, and also, you know, specifically in the areas with respect to success factors in those specific areas. So we always try to encourage those dialogues, you know, talk to these people, and we certainly try to make them available, have conversations, and, you know, get comfortable, because these are the guys that are going to make the difference. And when I say guys, of course, I'm using that term loosely. These are the people that are going to make that are going to make the difference. So we always encourage that. Yep. Okay. Uh, configuration development and testing work. So you should not underestimate the amount of time and effort that goes into the configuration development and testing of uh, the employee central environment, as well as the integrations back 
So what you're talking about as part of this implementation is really um, multiple levels of integration. You've got the initial data extraction from your legacy environment. You've got the import of that data into Employee Central, right? And then potentially, if you're doing any kind of replication process back to your legacy environment for um, just ongoing inter integration runs out of that system, then you've got an entire another data model mapping exercise that has to go back into the legacy system, uh, which is very commonly an SAP environment, but it really could be any legacy environment. So you need to plan a significant amount of time for the configuration development and testing of that process. Um, so just from the employee central process itself, uh, you're redesigning your entire data model, you're redesigning your workflow processes, uh, you need to make sure that it handles all of those fringe cases where uh, people are converting potentially from contractor to employee, employee to contractor, transferring between countries. Uh, all those types of scenarios are, are something that needs to be thought through thoroughly, uh, configured and tested properly, right, to make sure that it, it adheres to what your business requirements are, as well as captures the data that you need during those processes. Uh, from a legacy integration perspective, um, any time that you're dealing with a complete data model mapping and, and the transference of all data from one system to another on any kind of ongoing basis with no manual intervention, there's a lot of work that goes into that. So the requirements gathering process that we talked about on the first slide, you know, having those regional SMEs drive those, those detailed requirements for you helps tremendously with this process. But in the end, you still have a lot of mapping development. Usually there's uh, conditional mappings that need to take place. And those driving out those requirements, getting those developed and tested properly takes a significant amount of time. So don't underestimate it. It's not just, you know, I'm, I'm gonna run a report, extract the data and load it into my legacy environment. That I've never seen that be a true statement. It's always a, a mapping exercise with a lot of dynamic requirements in order to merge the two data models and have them integrate seamlessly. Dave, anything to add here? Um, no, um, maybe. <laughs> uh, as far as planning, always, you know, and, and this will be a, a theme that, that, that we'll discuss, I think, as, as we go through this. Uh, when it comes to planning, always, you know, th think about and include some contingency because it, it's just proper. It's easier to ask for things up front as in terms of more time, which usually equates into possibly more budget. Always do that up front. It's always easier to ask up front. And, as, and, and it, it obviously depends on, on the, the scale and the timeline of the project. The bigger the project, you know, the more prudent it is to include that contingency. Seven, from a middleware perspective, um, the main thing to keep in mind here is you kind of need to drive the requirements based on uh, what middleware package you, you currently potentially utilize, whether that's MuleSoft or uh, SAP Cloud Platform Integration slash HCI or Boomi. Um, you need to take into account, one, what are you trying to do? So if you're doing a employee central to SAP integration project, there's only two middleware platforms that are supported currently for that process, Boomi and HCI SAP Cloud Platform Integration. So if you're not currently utilizing those, then that's something that you need to take into account as part of the project because those are the only ones that have a standard process built out for them. If you're using uh, middleware to connect to a legacy environment that is not an SAP environment, then you have a lot more options in terms of your middleware platform. So at that point, you can reach out to uh, other third-party middlewares that, that are potentially something that you use today in your current landscape. So you need to understand what you currently have, right? What are you using today from a middleware perspective? What, what is the system that's connecting your current environment to external systems all around the world? And then based on your requirements, you know, from what, uh, driving out those requirements in terms of what, what systems you need to interact and have connect together, that's going to tell you what, what you need going forward, right? So 
as part of the requirements gathering process, we want to make sure that we detail out you know, what are you using today, what systems do you have connected today, as well as in the future state, will that current middleware platform be sufficient for your needs or do you need to potentially look at uh, switching to a different platform, at least from an employee central perspective. Right. Dave, anything here? I'll jump to the next one. Um, just, just to reinforce what you said, you know, uh, as far as uh, your, your current middleware platform, um, it, it may meet your current needs, but, you know, looking into the future, sometimes it's hard, hard to gauge. Is it time to make a, a, a move? Um, and, and if it is that time, you know, obviously that'll be more time, obviously more budget if you're going to move to a new product. And of course, uh, some additional education. So make sure you're you're choosing the, the partner that that can bring all that to the table and, and help you through that. So landscape matching, uh, another consideration as part of your uh, initial requirements is to think through how you want to. Uh, match your employee central slash success factors landscape to your current legacy landscape. So from an SAP perspective, there's traditionally a three-tier architecture for your SAP environments. You'll have a development environment, you'll have a QA slash testing environment, and then you'll have your productive environment. And those three tiers are uh, pretty well set in terms of, you know, you do your development, there's a transport process obviously within SAP to migrate your changes up to QA for validation, and then those changes are finally imported into production for productive use. From an SAP success factor slash employee central perspective, traditionally it's only a two-tier landscape. You have a development slash QA instance where you do all of your initial configuration, validate those changes, do all of your testing, and then you have your productive instance where you do obviously your your day-to-day -day production activities. So one consideration to take into account is do you want to mirror your instances from a success factors employee central perspective to your SAP instances? And there are pros and cons to both. One of them is uh, from an employee central perspective, there is no transport management process in place. So you have no capability for automatically moving all of your changes up from development to QA to production. Um, there are some things that can be uh, downloaded and imported into the next instance, but there are some sometimes issues with that. If the data models are not aligned perfectly, it won't let you do those download and upload imports. And then there are some activities that no matter what, you have to do manually to migrate them between the instances from on the cloud. So if you move to a three-tier landscape from a cloud perspective, there are considerations in terms of your time requirements uh, to maintain those three instances and keep them synchronized. However, it does afford you more testing capabilities. So if you make a change in your development SAP instance, for instance, you can test that against your development employee central instance. Uh, and avoid having to make a change, hope that it works, transport it up to your, your QA instance on your legacy landscape, and then start doing your testing. So there are pros and cons, but it's something that needs to be thought about up front and considered as there are cost implications to having three instances versus two. Dave, anything here? Uh, just that, uh, again, just to reinforce, landscape, you know, management in, in, in a cloud environment is clearly, as Michael said, it's different. Uh, it doesn't go away. So you got to be a little careful sometimes listening to the software vendors. It doesn't evaporate. It takes, you know, it, it takes a different form, obviously. But there are things that if, for instance, if you are moving from SAP on-prem, you know, going to cloud, uh, there are some things that you might be relying on today that just aren't quite there yet. And, and so it does involve some uh, mental flexibility and also, you know, just capability-wise, some, some flexibility in, in making that transition. Yep. Uh, next one is from a data migration perspective. So uh, data migration is something that 
uh, gets overlooked to some extent on, on projects, at least from an initial project planning perspective, unless you have experience with these types of implementations in the past. So being able to extract your data from your legacy environment, uh, your, the full set of employee data that you have stored in there, and then map that appropriately to your new SuccessFactors Employee Central data model is not a trivial process. Um, there are, usually you do not have a one-to-one -one exact data model match between what you have in legacy today and what you do in success factors in the future. And that's intentional. You, you want to take it as an opportunity to revise and, and clean up anything that's not uh, the way that you want it to be in terms of your data model going forward. So there is a mapping exercise that takes place as part of that, and some of it is dynamic or conditional mapping. So you may be consolidating groups of um, employee classifications down into a single classification going forward, or you may be splitting out stuff that currently is, is not split out the way that you would ideally like in your legacy environment. So anytime that you have a one-to-many, any dynamic mapping scenario like that, uh, that's gonna take some consideration both from the data migration side here as well as if you're pulling that data back into your legacy environment in the future, uh, thinking through what that mapping process would look like. Because obviously if you have dynamic mappings, you need to identify the fields that are conditional and required to make that happen. Um, so from a data migration perspective, it's not just I run a report and extract data from my legacy environment and I'm good to go. There's, there's a whole validation exercise that needs to be done in order to make sure you've extracted the data properly uh, with the correct date ranges and everything else associated with it, and that it's in a format that Employee Central can accept properly. So it's, it's not a trivial task, and it's something that you need to plan for appropriately as part of your project plan. Dave, anything to add on this one? Uh, just that, you know, we'll be talking more about the project plan, just to, just to reinforce that. So, you know, project planning is important. Do it early in the project and do it often. It's, it's an iterative thing, and, and we'll get to more of, of that. Absolutely. So the second half, uh, this is the midpoint, is, is what to avoid as part of your success factors journey. So we've talked through... Um, the initial uh, expectations in terms of what you need to consider up front. And this is gonna be more what pitfalls to avoid throughout the project. Uh, now, we had talked to Kayla originally about doing some questions here, but I think we're running slightly over on our time. So I think let's go ahead and just push through and then we'll do all the Q&A at the very end. That sounds great. If you have a question for David or Michael, go ahead and put those in the Q&A module and we'll handle those at the end of the session. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'll jump in and uh, introduce this, uh, this slide or this uh, talking point here. So don't get comfortable. And, and, and you know, this is, you know, what, what, what does that mean, You're, you might be thinking. So, you know, the whole point of, of these projects, or very frequently, is, is to do something differently and then hopefully better, right? So I'm going to use the word disruption. It's probably overused at this point, but uh, it, it, you know, going into a business process and then doing something differently is disruptive. It, it just is. And disruption is, is not comfortable. And when you're planning the project, I think it's, it's key to, you know, to, to keep uh, reinforcing um, that, that you need, that's the time to challenge. You know, challenge the way things are done. Certain things are being done probably very well. There are other things that are not being done so well. And, you know, talk about the process and figure out if it's being done well, it's fine, leave it. If it's not, let's challenge that. Let's make that better. So, so that, that's, that's the key message, I think, you know, to pretty much at, at when you're doing that initial planning, challenge everything. And then as you go through the project, continue to do that. Because on the front end of the project, when you're gathering the initial requirements, you can anticipate a lot. You cannot anticipate everything. So as you go through that project, continue to challenge. Maybe what you thought on the front end when you were planning seemed like a really good idea. Now that you've gotten some percentage through the project, you're smarter. Everyone's smarter, and you have now a different perspective. And don't be afraid to bring something back up and say, look, we thought 
this was a good approach. We thought this was a valid business requirement. Maybe it's not. So that's that's kind of the uh, the the main theme there. Um, it's also very important to define success. You have to define it because then you can measure it. Once you define it, you can measure it, and you will know when you're approaching it or when or when you get there. So those are things that uh, it should should never be never be shortcut. Communication obviously is key. Always communicate. And another theme will be, you know, as as you've already heard and as we go through this, will be communication. Through the planning process, through the requirements uh, definition process, and then through the execution and, you know, obviously testing. Communicate. You can't communicate too much. It's hard to do that. Um, planning is key, as, as we just uh, were talking about. Um, planning for contingency and, and the project plan. And as, let's see, I introduce or have reintroduced the, the concept of project planning, we can probably move on to the next slide because I think that focuses a bit more on that. So uh, project management office is, is important. It, it, it certainly is. And so here I want to talk a little bit about um, collaboration when it comes to project management. So the, the customer, um, typically has some kind of uh, project management office um, within, within the customer's organization. And it's very key to have someone involved in the project that thoroughly understands how project management is done internally and, and what the internal methodology is. Um, some companies have a very strong, clearly defined methodology. Some, it, it, it's more loose. So understanding that and then collaborating, you know, with the project manager or managers on the, on the consulting side is, is very important. Uh, understanding who's going to be responsible for what, how you work it together. It, it's all about collaborating and, and working it together. So, you know, doing a project plan is very important. You usually, you know, set the expectations. It's going to be high level. And as you go, again, you get smarter and you add more detail to that project plan. And you're always looking at it with a critical eye. How can we make this project plan better? What do we need to adjust? You know, it's got to work for, for the whole project, not just for a couple of the people. Uh, Short-term focus is good. Focus on the next couple of weeks, but always take that longer-term view. Everyone needs to know what they need to do this week. They need to know what's coming up next week. And they need to know longer-term, but that can be a little fuzzier. Right? So uh, reevaluate and adjust constantly. That, that's, that, that's the loop that you're going through. Project planning is iterative. Um, Set expectations about uh, roles, define the roles. And again, this is something that uh, at the beginning of the project, you define the roles. But th this, this could go through a transition also. As the, as the project goes, uh, you might discover that we have some, um, some expertise that maybe we're a little light on. Augment it. You know, it, it's, never, it's never too late to, um, to, you know, to, to, make, to make the project better. So have that attitude, and, and again, you know, communicate. Anytime there is a change, the, the, the key is to communicate and be inclusive. Uh, make sure you have contingency. I think we mentioned that before. Contingency is always best built in at the front. And, you know, a lot of times we've been through a lot of projects where you're driving sometimes to a number, a hard budget number. At the front end of the project, don't be afraid to challenge that. That's the time to challenge it. Um, maybe it can't be challenged, and then you have, but you always have options. You can trim the scope. You can take maybe more creative approaches, but you know, don't be afraid to challenge. Uh, that's that's what these projects are for. It's your opportunity to do that, and don't give up that opportunity. Um, do you need a hundred percent dedicated project manager? Well, you know, probably, but it depends again on uh, the key variables. There, I think, are scale. How big is the project? How long is the timeline? Um, what kind of expertise do you have in-house? And what kind of expertise do you want augmented? So uh, that can, and that can scale. Uh, again, it can scale depending on your needs. But, you know, it, it's hard, I think, to have too much project management. Uh, but you have to balance that, obviously, with cost. You, you always have to have a critical eye towards cost. Um, the key there, I guess, is collaboration. Right, and project, you know, the key project management activities obviously are the project plan, uh, making sure that you got a handle on issues, recording the issues, tracking and driving it to resolution. You're always identifying risks and how to mitigate 
you have a, want to have a clear project management or project governance process. If, if an issue comes up in the project that the people on that project can't resolve, who do you go to? And, and what are the expectations of this time to resolve that? You don't want to sidetrack your project because you can't get a, a decision. So finding the governance process up front is very key. And then again, communication is, is, is also key. Um, any, any other uh, additions or comments on that? Michael? No, I think you covered it pretty well, actually. Okay, cool. Uh, we can probably jump ahead then. Okay, IT is criti critical to success. Yeah, absolutely. So in general, and this is a generalization, uh, IT folks, or at least some of the folks on, from IT, are probably more used to running and managing projects than other parts of the business. I mean, that, that tends to be true, but it's not always true. And if that is the case, then, you know, make use of that, leverage that. Use those, those folks that, that have that project background, that, that know how to define a project, know how to manage it, and, and know how to define issues and, you know, drive them to resolution and, and all that stuff. Um, you know, work with the, the PMO if, if that is part of IT. Another, another major um, part that, that IT can, can usually play is the definition of, of, of the landscape, you know, the technical landscape and then how they're currently managing it. And, and then, you know, obviously communicating to them what, what the future is going to look like and making sure that they have the resources on staff or the ability at least to train and get them uh, their, their resources to support that, that future state, uh, that landscape. Um, the current people in-house can also be very helpful in terms of development and uh, developing integration or implementing integration or from more of a, from a technical standpoint again. If you got those resources in-house, get them on the project. You can facilitate knowledge transfer that way and they can be very helpful and maybe shortcut some of the timelines. And I'd just like okay. to reiterate from an, from an yeah. IT perspective, um, having those individuals engaged early is, is extremely valuable, mainly from uh, the perspective of being able to identify issues in the integration, making sure that they understand the network, um, you know, IT structure requirements if you if you need to open up firewall ports, uh, et cetera, based on how your network architecture is currently set up for your organization, uh, to be able to uh, allow connectivity between your current on-premise environments and your cloud solution that you're now moving to. In addition, having IT involved uh, helps cut down and uh, on the timeline and expedite the process of uh, dealing with, you know, Active Directory integrations, single sign-on requirements, all those types of things which, which are going to be transitioning if you move your HR instance to the cloud to more of an integrated type process using those same uh, network calls and, and firewall ports. So um, it's something that they need to be involved in early in order to help drive out those requirements and raise any red flags or, or any additional considerations that need to be determined. Yep, good, good stuff. Okay, let, let's move to the change management, the next slide. Okay, change management, um, again, you know, always important and, and it increases with importance, I, I think, again, you know, based on the scale of the project and, and how much of, of your employee population are you going, you going to impact. And the more people you're going to impact, all, all the more important, you got to have a, a, a pretty clear change management plan. So when I think of change management, I think of three major components. And that's, you know, obviously the, the change management, what is changing, what is, uh, who's going to be impacted, and, and, you know, what is the timing of all that. And then communication plan, having a very good communication plan. And then the, the, the third point is all around uh, training or, or knowledge transfer and training, and then understanding the difference between knowledge transfer and training and, and having a good plan to implement that. Um, so it, having said what is the difference, let, let me give a, at least my definition of that. So knowledge transfer is something that happens more or less organically. Uh, throughout the, it should be happening throughout the project. And it should be, you know, with including uh, resources from the customer and making sure they understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and then going forward how they're going to manage it because it's, it's going to be, it's going to be up to them to manage it going forward. 
and, and that's knowledge transfer. Training is something that that's a, a bit more formal, a, a bit more defined, and, and use, usually uh, it, it should be something that's reusable, right? So you can do it once, twice, three times. You can repeat it. Um, and, and, and so, therefore, it, it's packaged a little differently, and, and it might take different forms of, you know, self-study, something that's facilitated, and, and, and so on. Um, so that's all important stuff. So um, technical configuration versus human understanding and, ex and acceptance. This is also key, right? So it, it's, we can move through technical configuration fairly quickly, usually. But the acceptance of the impact of that, you know, what does that mean to, to the business process? What does that mean to the, the series of screens that I'm dealing with? How do I navigate this? It looks different than it did before. All those kinds of things. It takes time for, for people to accept that and, and, and really thoroughly understand that. And, and, you know, don't be afraid to repeat. It, it's all about repetition and establishing some, some new better habits, hopefully. Um, so the, the UI, the user interface, is, is obviously very important to understand, and, and the whole UX, the user experience. Understanding the data is always key. Hopefully the data will look, uh, will look pretty much the same or similar, or at least you can relate it back to what you had seen before. But all these things, you know, I guess the key is that these things all take time. The, the workflow and approval process may change, you know, through the, uh, through the project and, and as a result of the project. Um, and then there's, you know, again, so as you get nearer to cut over and go live, you know, the whole platform adoption, uh, adaption and knowledge transfer and training, that, that's when more of that stuff kind of kicks in. Okay. Any, um, anything to augment there? Any reinforcements or anything? I would just uh, reiterate that this is a Whenever you're moving from a, a legacy environment to a cloud-based environment, it's a big change to your end users. It, um, it affects their day-to-day -day activities, what they need to log into, uh, what they see on a day-to-day -day basis from a, a data visualization perspective. And having a good change management plan in place to help make sure that they um, understand what's coming as part of the project, so having good communication up front, pushing out regular notices of, of the new functionality that's coming with updates, as well as proper training or recordings, uh, et cetera, in order to help them with, uh, you know, job guides, basically, so that they can continue to do their daily activities after go live uh, is really invaluable. It's, it's a requirement for a project like this, so it's not something that should be underestimated. Yep. Yeah. Good, good, good points. Excellent. So let's move on to testing. So don't underestimate testing. Uh, yes, and, and again, testing is one of those things that usually takes a little longer than you thought it was going to take. Um, and, and just uh, one of the things I want to do here is just kind of highlight the uh, the different phases of testing. So um, and, and they're probably more or less what you're used to, but let me run through them just to provide some definition. So uh, initially, uh, success factors uses a methodology um, that is iterative in nature. And, and by iterative, I mean there's uh, business requirements are defined, and then there's some configuration done, and then there's some testing that happens, you know, bang, 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 those, those three things. And typically, uh, per the methodology, that uh, there are three iterations of that happening. And so, you know, one of the values in that is, is that the, uh, the consultants don't go away for a real long period of time. It, it, it's fairly, it's shorter bursts, and, and so they're, they're, that in, reinforces more engagement, you know, uh, from, from the user community and from, you know, just in, from the business in general, that iterative approach. That testing tends to be quite, um, narrow in scope, I would say. You're, you're testing specific configurations that have been performed, that have been done. To make sure you didn't break anything, to make sure that they technically work, but you're not necessarily testing the whole business process in, 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 in that context. So it, it, it's more of a, of a technical testing phase. It's the place to start because you want to start with a smaller scope in, in testing and then grow it. The next uh, significant phase of testing is what I would, be, what I would call integration testing 
integration testing tests, it, it, now you're taking more of a business process approach, but you're still not necessarily testing the whole business process. It's more maybe parts of the process, but it's the, the scope is broadening. And then there's the, the next phase being more of a business process end to end. So now you're taking the whole business process, you're starting from the beginning and you're testing all the way through, including any kind of data that's, that's flowing, like in this case, out of success factors, some other application, if it's flowing back in, you're, you're testing end to end through that whole business process. Uh, another type of testing, and this is especially relevant if there's any kind of payroll implication, is, is a parallel test where you were getting close is, is not good enough. So w w with a parallel, and if it's, par if it's payroll, you know, getting close is just not good enough. We don't want our paychecks to be eh, kind, of, kind of close. We want them to be exactly spot on. So that requires, obviously, additional testing. And then, uh, depending on how much you're impacting that, there might be m multiple uh, iterations of parallel. But th that's where you're comparing some results to a, a period that you've already processed in the past. So you know what the answers are and you're trying to match to that. And then the, the final stage of testing is user acceptance. And, and, and this is where most of the administration of that test cycle is being in the hands of, of the customer. You, you want, at, at this point, the customer should be comfortable enough to define the test, test criteria, uh, having defined, you know, the test scripts in collaboration with the consultants, executing on those test scripts and making sure that things are working as they should be working. How do you know if they're working the way they should be working? You're always comparing back to the business requirements. Are you meeting the business requirements? And then you, you, you're going through that list and you're checking it. That's your measure. Uh, and if it's not, then you, you iterate and, and you do it again. Hopefully by the time you get the user acceptance test, you're not going to find any big surprises because of these other um, phases of testing that you've already been through. Um, what drives testing is creation of test scripts, so the, and that should be a collaborative effort. Uh, the best projects that, that we have seen is, is where there is a clear collaboration. Uh, consultants obviously can bring something to the table because we've, you know, that's what we do. We see a lot of projects. However, the customer knows their data and they know specifically, you know, cases that they need to test. So it's that blending that, that, makes, uh, that makes for good test results. Uh, test scripts should be reusable. It's something that you're probably not going to use once. And then even after the project over is over, you will probably make use of those test scripts for, um, for uh, just testing your, uh, your success factors instance uh, on, on the success factors release schedule uh, to make sure that nothing was broken. So it, it's a good investment. It takes time to, to create good test scripts, but it's usually a good investment of time. Uh, and then, of course, data. you got to have good data to test and making sure that you have high-quality data. Any, anything else there? Yeah, from a testing perspective, um, running the full end-to-end -end, uh, integration testing where you do your data conversion, extraction, validate the results, import that into your employee central um, instance, validate that the import successful, checking for errors, and then if you're running a replication back to your legacy environment, testing that whole process, making sure that all the data wrote back successfully, that you're not changing anything. Um, theoretically, you should have no changes when you send the data back to your legacy environment, right? Uh, if you've mapped everything appropriately and if, if all the data comes through identically. So that whole end-to-end -end testing of the integration process is, is time consuming and can be manual. Uh, in a lot of instances just due to the nature of the errors for imports the, that you would encounter. So don't underestimate the amount of time that it takes to go through that end-to-end -end process and track down and diagnose uh, those issues because some of them can be rather cryptic in terms of their description. Yep, good, good points. And uh, let me make one more comment on um, uh, test lead. Should you have a test lead? Probably, and again, it, it depends on, you know, somewhat on, on, on the scope and, and scale of the project. Uh, the, the test lead works, you know, very closely with, with the project manager, but uh, obviously they're, they're focused on that, that phase or phases of the project where you're concentrated, where you're focused on, on testing. And, and it, it usually can, uh, can help. It, 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 there's just an additional then uh, facilitator for, you know, defining 
defining issues and resolving issues, tracking um, defects and making sure that the defects are visible, that people know that this is a defect, we need to work this, we need to resolve it. And, and that just takes additional coordination, and, and usually the, the, test, uh, the test lead can, can help drive that. Okay, anything else at this point? Um, I, I think we're going to then ask for some questions, maybe, at this point. If, if there's, yeah. or are there any, any other comments? Yeah. We did have some questions come in. So, um, okay. actually, I want to, David and Michael, do you have anything else to add before we dive into these? No, nope, not from my side. Awesome. Okay. Well, before we do that, though, I just want to, um, we have a few minutes left. Just as a reminder, if you do have a question, be sure to enter it into the Q&A module. And obviously, a lot's been covered in the last 40 minutes or so. So we do encourage you to continue the conversation uh, with our presenters beyond today's session. If you can go ahead, Michael, and switch it to that last slide, I want to make sure we share your contact info with everyone. Great. Um, their contact info is here in the slide deck. We'll also be sending everyone a link to a follow-up blog post where we'll be addressing some of the key takeaways from today um, and some questions to ponder. So. With that, there are some questions that came in. I'll go ahead and jump into those. You actually, I'm gonna go with this one right now uh, because we were just talking about the importance of testing. How many cycles of testing are typical? So typically you would have uh, in a normal Employee Central project, three iterations of testing uh, and review. So you configure, you validate, uh, do your testing, that leads to additional changes to your configuration workbook, which leads to the, the next iteration of testing. So there's three traditional cycles of just iterative testing, and then you have user acceptance testing on top of that at the end. So it's really four full cycles. Now, obviously that can vary. So um, a lot of customers will do uh, conversion dry runs, stuff like that, where you have almost an additional cycle of testing of the integration process beyond what what is currently considered for the three iterations plus UAT. Uh, also, if you have uh, an on-premise payroll system as part of the project, uh, there may be additional testing requirements for that in order to make sure that you have enough uh, runs to do your full uh, payroll parallel testing. So uh, traditionally it would be four, but it can be adjusted based on uh, the, the specific business requirements de depending on integration requirements, depending on the payroll run uh, testing that needs to be done. Dave, any comments on that? Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I more or less uh, agree with that. And I, w I would say probably more, more like five. And again, depending on, on the scale of the project. So in between, so after the iterative testing, the, the, the three rounds of that and before the UAT, Typically, we see some kind of more business process focused testing where you're taking into account. It's almost like a dry, not a dry run, but it's almost, it is clearly in preparation for the UAT. But, but you want to, again, to minimize any uh, surprises that are going to happen in the UAT, you maybe go through a, a more of a business process focused end to end testing. Uh, and, and then transition in, into the user acceptance test. And, and also, it, let me emphasize that as you go through those phases of testing, on the front end, when it's more the iterative testing, the consultants are playing a very, very big part in that. And as you go through these phases of testing, then the consultants are backing off uh, until you get to the point of the user acceptance test where pretty much that, that's completely being managed by the customer. So there, there's transition, knowledge transfer, obviously, happening through that whole testing process also. Hopefully that helps. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, no, great answers. And um, <clears throat> so then, actually, Dave, I'm missing this one over to you, or you, you both can respond to this one too. What is your opinion of so called rapid deployment solutions for success factors implementations? Okay, yeah, good, good question. So ra rapid deployment is, uh, it get, get, gets a lot of uh, press and, and a lot of coverage. And, uh, you know, the whole point there, it, it's a very good objective. Do something better and faster. And, and we're always working for that. Rapid deployment can be, and, and this is, you know, my, my opinion, it can be a good solution. It's probably not a solution for every project. Some projects, um, 
just um, shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't do them too fast. And, and again, it depends on, on the scale and, and uh, you know, the overall scope and, and just the, the breadth of the project of, of what you're trying to accomplish. So what, first of all, what does rapid deployment mean? Typically that means that you're, that you're going to shortcut the, the configuration and, and the upfront, the requirements gathering. You always need requirements. You can't not to do the requirements. You always need the requirements. An adequate time should always be put to the requirements. Rapid deployment is, is, more, is a lot of managing expectations. This means that the company, the, the customer, is accepting the so-called, you know, standard business processes, best practices, whatever you want to call them. And they're going to be comfortable with that and live with that. So that's a huge decision. And not every company can really say, yes, we're going to change our processes to meet the so-called, you know, industry best practices. So that needs a lot of, um, you know, analysis and, and, and some decisions made up front. Can the culture of your company really handle that type of accelerated change over a short period of time. And, and, and again, just to reinforce it, it's we can move and, and configure the, the system pretty quickly. The, the bigger variable is can the customer accept it very quickly? And what happens after go live? You know, the, the, usually a rapid deployment solution will, will, dic will necessitate more support after go live. Because you've moved so quickly, you probably didn't get uh, as much knowledge transfer in as you should have and you don't want it to fall apart after go live. So but that, that, that's my take on it. Thank you. And how long does a typical implementation take? Um, yeah, good, good question. Again, it depends, you know, uh, obviously on the scope. Uh, each, each module, and, you know, if you talk about success factors, each module has, um, you know, we can go through each module, and each one has, eh, you know, more or less a, a, a timeline. With uh, obviously, you have to look at the variables and see if you can compress that or, or, or drag it out. EC, uh, let's start there. Um, probably somewhere around nine to ten months, depending on how many countries there are, how many languages are involved. You know, how just just the whole the the, the scale of the of the users that will be using it, and and. How many are there, and how do you? How many people have to be trained? So that can that can certainly scale up to a year, you know, a year and a quarter, or whatever, 15 months, or, or or even more. And and then there's all always a phasing option. You can phase in by geography, by sections of, of the globe, or you know by uh, or, or regions that do things in a similar fashion uh, with respect to business process. So phasing is, is always, I think, a good option because it, it kind of, it increases the focus and it increases, I think, your, usually increases your chance for success. Do something on a smaller scale, do it right, get some credibility, and then take the next step. However, you know, that can be more expensive also. You know, and, and so a lot of times, you know, support would be needed for these types of implementations. So what are the typical customer consultant roles that are needed for these initial workshops? Well, I, I'm sorry, say that one more time. What, what is the importance of support? Was that basically the question? No, no, sorry, sorry. I know sometimes that, that's, sorry. I was saying what are the typical customer or consultant roles that are needed for these initial workshops? For the initial workshops, right. The, the initial workshops are all about, you know, again, communication is key, but, but uh, you know, the, the, main, the, the main driver of the initial workshops is about defining business requirements. Um, there should be some element of what do your current business processes look like, not, not to dwell on it too much, but at least so everyone on the project team has a, has a good understanding, and that's mostly for education of the consultants, right? So they, they know what, what currently exists, and then defining the, the business requirements for the future. And then you can measure the change. Well, this is what you got now. This is what you're going to have. The change is, is this. And, and then, you know, focus on, on that change and how you're going to affect that change, how you're going to support it, and then you evaluate, you know, the whole project plan based on that. Make sure you have the right resources assigned and, and, and things, things like that. Great. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions coming through. Um, so we'll go ahead and start wrapping things up. I want to say thank you 
again to today's speaker and thanks to everyone who attended for your time and attention. We do hope that you'll join us again for more webinars. Registration is available at gcstrategies.com under the tab webinars. I wish everyone on the call a wonderful and productive rest of your